welcome. My name is Anjani. I completed, I grad, or haven't graduated officially yet, but I completed the program in, uh, or a couple months ago. I'm currently at Time Magazine here in Hong Kong. Um, I, before I came to the program, I was in finance, and I did not have a journalism background. So I did, and while um, I was at the JMSC, I did an internship at CNN during my first semester. I did a win winter internship in India at the New York Times, and then I um, am now at Time Magazine, and I'm going to the Wall Street Journal later this month um, for a full-time job. And I'm gonna keep this really short, but I think you know my message to you guys as an alum and um, for you guys entering the program, it is an absolute gold mine of resources. But the one thing you have to remember is that you have to really go out and get it. You have to be focused and you have to know what you want. Um, there are excellent resources. And it, you know, it's kind of, you know, I'll draw an analogy for you guys. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. You'll get the hints, you know, people are there, but you have to go and look for yourself. Um, that said, while being focused and um, of course, you know, nothing's gonna get handed to you. No one is going to say, oh, here's a job for you, here's an internship for you. You have to realize that in this day and age, and you know, people have been saying this, um, you have to have a skill set. You have to have a relevant skill set. So, you know, and Doreen and I were just talking about this. You have to be able to handle a camera. You have to be able to do these things. And while that may not be your interest area, you should have that skill because in this world of you know, multimedia and everything going online and becoming digital, you have to be able to handle it. Um, but have your focus area. And um, lastly, just be resilient. There will be rejections. You will, you know, you will wonder why the hell you're doing this. But um, know that at the end of this, something good will come out. Just keep working hard. And um, of course, have a good time. And make sure you leverage all the resources. These people can really help you. Thank you. My name is Patrick. Um, I'm now with the South China Morning Post. Um, I, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I graduated two years ago. Uh, no, one year ago, one year ago. And um, yeah, I think this place will help you in two ways. It help, has helped me in two ways. Uh, one way was um, the skills. Just the, they will teach you how to write, how to, uh, how to uh, do video, photo, how to work online um, in a way that you're confident with your work. And that's really important when you go into a new job or a new internship. Probably your first internship will be maybe in this December or, or earlier, maybe earlier than that. And uh, the second skill I learned here was to think like a journalist. I don't come from a journalism background. And um, it was really hard to, to, to think like a journalist, not like an academic, and to really just say the, say the things you want to say. Don't be sophisticated. Um, write to serve, not to impress. And that, that kind of journalism mindset, pe these people here will really help you uh, get that mindset. And, that's, um, and that is really extremely valuable, I think. Uh, try to, um, I would say, try to do as much as possible in your time here. And try to freelance, try to write, go out there and travel. And um, there's a lot of, um, um, you, can, you can finance trips by freelancing. You can finance trips by freelancing. And um, try to just do as much as possible. Don't. Don't let the year just go past. I mean, these people will not let you just do nothing, but try to do it as much as possible. Oh yeah, um, uh, so, oh, be before I came here, I was, uh, I was first uh, with um, Austrian, and before I came here, I was uh, with the Austrian Ministry of Defense um, doing research, and then I joined the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs was in charge for press in Beijing, and then, um, yeah, and now I'm with the South China Morning Post. South China Morning Post. South China. Oh, China. China, yeah, how about China? China stars.
Okay, um, my name is Jing, and uh, I'm mainland Chinese, and I'm now working at Lloyd's List. It's a London-based uh, English language newspaper uh, dedicated to the global shipping industry. So basically, what I and I'm one of the Asia correspondent based in Hong Kong, and I uh, cover basically what feels like a little bit boring to people outside of the industry like shipping and uh, shipbuilding, like heavy industries and the ports. Uh, so it's a kind of a like specialized uh, area of business and financial journalism. And before I came to the program, I had a Bachelor of Economics from China and uh, I have some um, job experience, but now in particular in media. Mm, and and during the program, I had two internships. First, it's with Taishin Media, and uh, probably the three from China would know this outlet. And second is with uh, Financial Times, a Hong Kong bureau. So my advice is similar to what um, Anjani and uh, Petra ha have offered. I think um, you need to, there, the, the curriculum is great. You get to a taste of everything, um, but I think um, you have to identify a particular area of interest as early as possible, because if you really want to be a journalist, ultimately you will be landing to do something very specific and build from there. Nobody's gonna hire you to write something, to start a, a, writing something as microeconomics or politics in journal. And by then over time, you will be able to do that. So, and also the journalism mindset and approach I learned from the program. Um, as I said, I have a Bachelor of Economics. So, but then what I, and that I had a concentration on business and financial journalism taught by Jeff, Jeff and uh, Rusty. Um, what I learned from those three courses was not the knowledge per se, but I think the an entire new different approach to look at the same things I already knew to think and uh, pursue things as a journalist. Um, and also leverage the resources JMSC can provide you here. And um, at, be proactive and engage yourself. Thank you. I'm the last but not the least. Uh, my name is Fan Di, and I am a fresh grad. I just graduated from uh, like two months ago, and uh, I'm not as successful as these guys. They have like fancy, fantastic jobs, but I'm not. I'm still job hunting, but uh, I have confidence. And uh, I'm from Chinese mainland, and uh, before joining this program, I have six years of experience in journalism. Uh, I started from China Daily, like. Uh, seven years ago when I was a f truly fresh grad and then uh, uh, I jumped ship to foreign media like in China and I mainly worked for uh, Al Jazeera English and uh, Canada's global television and uh, uh, welcome about to JMSC especially to the Chinese students because I'm from China and I think these people like the three people before me have said enough about the cons and pros of this program and uh, I think we can actually uh, exchange and can share some of my good and bad experiences in our buffet and uh, I'm open to any kind of questions and provide my insights and experience in it. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs> part-time student. Any advice for part-time students to do this program? Um, I was a full-time student, but of course I have some friends who were part-time students. Um, 
and you know, they took their time, they did the same, they actually, a friend of ours actually, a f well, a friend of ours, I guess, she's still a part-time student, and she did an internship, she actually had more time to do an internship, um, you know, during the day, on some days, and, um, you know, you can make, you can have a similar experience, it's effectively more spread out, so, that's really it. I'm sorry, I don't have more advice. That can be a little hard at first, um, you know, finding time to come to classes, to do your assignments, and so on and so forth. But it is also do it in bite-sized chunks rather than being um, over ambitious. But this is going to be the only problem that you face that is different, and that is balancing your work and your your studies. So do it in manageable chunks. You've got two years to finish it in, and uh, you'll be fine. Um, I have a question for the First Lady because I'm pretty curious because you said you had no journalistic experience be before coming to this program, right? right? And me too, and also the guy before me. So I want to ask, how did you have such amazing um, internship experience and so good job even though you have no journalistic experience and any advice for students like me that know nothing about journalism? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's hard. So, you know, the advantage for me, and I say this a lot, is that I came in almost as a clean slate. So I wasn't in journalism. I came in and soaked in everything that was taught. So when I learned how to write, I learned from completely, I didn't learn how to write from scratch, of course, but, you know, formulating a clear, solid, focused story came easier to me. It wasn't kind of clouded by other styles of writing or anything like that. Um, and the second thing is, is that I just, you know, I knew I wanted certain things and I just went and got them. You have to work really hard and I think you have to really put yourself out there. So I made sure that I had good writing samples early in the year. Um, I made sure, you know, you have to be strategic about these things as well. And that's what I was saying earlier. While everything is available, you have to really work hard to get it. And, um, you know, you have to sell yourself. You have to, you have to, you know, show them what are you bringing to the table? You know, are you... What is special about you? You may not be a journalist, and that's totally fine, but that's why you're in this program. That shows your dedication of wanting to pursue this career, is that you are now doing a master's in journalism. And so if you can bring that and kind of bridge the gap as part of your story, as part of what you do, and bring that and kind of go to the table, people love it, you know, and prove it, you know. Show them proof that, you know what, I'm good, I can do this. So that's, you know, that's the only advice I have. And Doreen. Um, if, if I can just follow up on that. Um, she said something really interesting. She says, what do you bring to the table? That's what employers want to know. What is something special? So what she had is her background in investment banking, right? You know, she had a financial background. So what is your background? What do you bring to the table? What did you do? I was, um, my major was English in bachelor program and I worked as an edu a teacher. Okay. A teacher, so no experience. Okay, but, but you d might not know what you have. We had a student come here from mainland China. She had no investment banking background. She had no financial background. She knew social media. So she really developed that and really saw how you could use that. And she got hired by the South China Morning Post and now I think she says Reuters um, as developing this social media editor, where she helps the newspaper, she helps the news organization develop their policy using social media for their journalism. So you have to think, what is it that you do? Does it necessarily have to be your undergraduate degree? It can, if that's great, but you have to think yourself in the mind of the employer. What do you bring to the table? Not give me a job because I need a job. It's like, what can I do to help you? A lot of employers also like us because they ha we have something called reverse mentoring. They love the fact that you know things that they don't know uh, because you have the latest techniques, you have the latest knowledge base, you have the latest you know, um, skill set. So that is something that you have to think about as you go about looking for jobs. Were 
any of your, aside from your expertise in different areas, were any of your, any of your employers actually interested in your writing and how well you wrote? Absolutely. I mean, that goes without saying. I don't think any of these people would even give you a second look without looking at it. Yeah, I mean, okay, they, you know, your resume or what you've done kind of sets the baseline. And above and, be above and beyond that, and that's why I said, you know, I tried to get good writing samples out early in the year because they want to see what you can, you know, how you, how you look for sources, how, how do you put together a story, how do you give it an interesting angle, and how do you write? Do you write well? I mean, lyrical sentences are amazing and they sound fantastic, but can you write a clear, solid story? I think that, and they definitely look for that, and I continue to find that. So. Another thing is that if you can bring stories to the newspaper, like if you have to, like even if your writing is not perfect, but you can bring new stories to the newspaper, they, I think employers really want that. Yeah. Like, you, you're not, you're not like the person who write, who does the write up, but you're the person who actually brings in your narrative. I think, that, that's the that's the most important thing. And I also want to add, um, the, my example is only in the financial journalism area, but I think it's also applica applica applicable. Because um, first is that if you work for a business news outlet, then you have to be able to turn out fast, turn out clean copies. It's, it's very, um, it's, it's time pressure, like the earning stories, what we are having now. I mean, what I want to say is that I, my writing skill, because English is not my first language either, and my writing skill gets really sharpened during the program, because I think I worked hard on um, getting the school assignments down, and you will get a lot of writing um, assignments, and you need to really work hard on them. And in terms of the clips you want to present to your employer, I think, if your um, school assignments are good enough, they can also be presented. And also, what impressed me that I can tell you my f two things. First is that I think when I first joined my job, then I came to work, then I find out actually the first uh, uh, the first several weeks of assignments are just like what I did in, during the program. I need to turn out clean copy, solid copy very fast, and then I move on to do longer in-depth stories. And second is that some of the contests you may not believe I made during the program because I had to approach some experts and to finish my assignment and some of them I still till this day talk to them. So it's really um, practical, the program. Um, I think the core of a story is still the content. No matter how fancy your writing skill is, but the core and the heart the soul of an article is still the content. I can share experience when I was interning and when I was an undergrad. I was interning at China Features, China Features at Xinhua News Agency, which is the biggest uh, news agency in China. And I was writing about uh, the pop culture of China, the super girls. And because uh, I, I was uh, majoring in English and news writing, I thought I was writing a really fancy good story. And then I brought it to my editor. And then my, I, I thought I could get a really fancy feedback. But it turned out that my editor told me, it was like, Fan Di, what are you writing about? This can't be a new story like 10 years ago. It does not have any kind of news value. So then I realized like it wasn't a new story. It's only a fancy kind of writing piece. So the core is still the content. That's what you're going to uh, learn from this project from this first semester on. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question uh, just for the whole panel. Um, do you have any advice about uh, pitching uh, your stories that you write uh, in class to uh, media agencies? How do you go about doing that? Is it difficult to do so? Is it encouraged? And uh, have any of you done this? And has it worked out? Have you benefited from it? I think I think it's encouraged, right? Is it? Yeah, it is, right? Um, I think it's it's easy. A lot of media organizations are looking for content just to to feed the beast because they they need to keep their websites going with independent content. 
but you have to be aware um, of like when you um, you have to be cautious because you have to really know what kind of article you're pitching to what kind of publication like you cannot if you pitch if you pitch an article to a publication that usually doesn't run this kind of stories they will they will already remember you as the guy who doesn't know the publication so be very cautious be very we're very conscious about that when you when you pitch stories, and uh, the other thing is um, use uh, um, ask ask people here to uh, proofread your stuff, like let them read through it, give and ask your ask your classmates to read through it and ask them like how to improve it. Um, I I was um, I was freelancing here and um, I've, I've I've from a couple of places while I was studying here. And um, it was really helpful to have club classmates and also my, my writing class teacher. Um, is, is, is Barry teaching this year? He's, yeah, he's, he's good. Uh, to read through it and give me feedback before I pitch the, the story to a publication. Um, I actually didn't freelance that much, as much as Patrick did. Um, and you know, one reason was, and I look back, and this is one thing I think everyone should uh, pay attention to, is I was hesitant. I always w wondered, I was like, how do I go tell, r randomly cold call or send an email, be like, hi, I'm a student, I want to send you a story. I almost, I've hesitated all the time. Um, but, you know, I developed the courage by the second semester, and I had written a story in class on I think it was on green bonds or something. And I found it, you know, I found a media organization, a Chinese media, it was like, it's called China Dialogue. It's based in London. And they do a lot of environmental stuff. And I said, oh, well, let me just give this a shot. And it was completely out of the blue and I did it. And, and they accepted it and they published it and they, they loved it. And I realized, I was like, what the hell, what, what was I doing for the last six months? Why was I hesitating? And, you know, to attest to what Patrick was saying, you know, they want it. They will. They they love fresh perspectives. They want new stories. You know, if you can, and it's not confined to Hong Kong. You know, it doesn't mean you're confined. To, you can pitch stories in in India, in the U.S., wherever you want to pitch. Um, relevant, of course. And I think, yeah. And I think publications have to be. Your story has to be relevant to the publication. Uh, just a reminder that uh, they did, I, I find they also pitch a story, right? Uh, for South China Morning Post, a story on food safety. And actually, uh, a fellow student helped you put it in and something, right? Uh, but for the first semester, my advice is that focus and focus and focus. Um, get the skills down packed and um, talk to your professors, you'll be in writing classes. And that's why that writing course is so important. And that means even those of you who have uh, experience in journalism, you're not exempted from it because it's so important. So pay attention, work with that. Uh, and then when you want to pitch stories, when you do freelancing, consult with the professors because there are also adequate of doing it, right? Uh, ways of doing it, there are ethical questions involved, so we'll explore more with you. And we have done workshops on freelancing, and that will, we can do that uh, as well. Um, but uh, and you, you, you will have all the support system, and you are actually also encouraged to uh, freelance, because you're not doing homework for the classes, you're doing assignments. You are professional journalists. See, and that's how we expect of you. Uh, I've heard that one of the uh, biggest diploma uh, that foreign media face is that um, it's very hard to find uh, appropriate uh, news sources or uh, appropriate in interviewers on sensitive topics. So do you have particular ways to uh, persuade someone or convince someone um, who is still in hesitation to accept your interview or provide you facts on sensitive topics? Um, 
so I, you know, I've, I've faced that a couple of times for, for some stories that I've done on India that have been sensitive and and I'm not, you know, and it's still something, it's again, you kind of, you, you have to kind of work around it, you have to work, you have to develop a relationship and I think that's what's important. Um, they have to trust you and what you have to realize is that, you know, when, and when you start writing more, you don't have to quote everybody, you know, there's understanding, there's deep understanding, there's, you know, there's background, like you need to have, and I think you have to figure out where you want to use it. If a person doesn't want to be quoted, that's fine, but you can under, by, by listening to what they have to say off the record, you know, only gives you a better understanding and like your story becomes that much more solid. So there are ways to one, work with it and work, use it to your benefit. Um, but there isn't, I mean, I, there's no, I don't, I, I, unfortunately I don't have kind of a, a formula that you can apply to, you know, or a trick or anything like that. So your question is about how to convince people to talk to you or to be quoted. Sensitive topics. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, as uh, Anjani said, I think it really takes time to build a relationship and trust. And I think one of the ongoing challenges when you are working as a reporter that you have to cultivate your sources all the time and in various ways, but without undermining your integrity. And, and there is no formula, but I think that you have to ascertain the situation every time it's different. Like, think from other people's shoes, think what they think, uh, how he or she, how your interviewer uh, views the pros and cons speaking to you. And even if he, even if this person shuts the door this time, it doesn't mean that he'll shut the door forever. And one Per, one, one person doesn't speak to you, but there will be other people speaking to you too. And also, you don't need to quote anything, but in a story, you need some, you, you know, good enough story, you need on the record quotes, but then the, there are also people, you need to like lab, manage how to use the resource in different, for different use of yourself. And I can give you an example, it's like, and also patience, when you, when you, you need to make people feel that you are really trying to, get something done that you actually have a job to do. And some people will just sympathize because not really sympathize that way. But I, I remember there was once an executive told me that I talked to the press because I know, I realized the reporters, they also have a job to do. And, and, but not many people have this understanding. But what I meant is that you, you have to let people know that you are honest. You are not up for something not good for them. And, and I think people, they are good hearted people will help you. And I'll give you an example. I, I once wanted to have an interview with a, a, the, the chairman of one of the biggest uh, stay owned companies in China. And it took me eight months from my pitch interview till I finally got it. Eight months. But then there are many up and turn downs on during the time. And I was very glad. And, and also, I had the pleasure that after the interview, I had me to send back them the draft to check and all the, press, all the censorship they demanded. And you have to find, fend them off. It took time, and, but I think you can do it. It, it takes time, but you know, you'll. Um, Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, right? And sometimes it may take eight months and sometimes it may take eight hours. It may take eight, you know, you just, you never know. Um, but I think those are kind of the basic tenets that you just kind of follow is you need to let people know that you have a job to do and you're doing this for the right reason. You know, I was talking to a woman two weeks ago who I was writing a story on child abuse in Sri Lanka and she was with the government and she just didn't want to speak. She spoke, to, she finally spoke to me but just didn't give me a straight answer. And the first thing she said to me, she's like, you know, I was misquoted. I got a, in a big fight with the BBC journalist. I don't want to talk to you. I said, listen, like, I'm just doing this for a good cause. I, I, I said it in so many words, and I'm doing this to get a message across. I'm not doing this to bash the government. I'm not doing this. I have no ulterior motives. And, you know, and they'll, she was useless to me, but, you know, it, people need to know that. So people need to talk. Like, I didn't quote her. I didn't use anything, but... I would just add that 
you have to show these people when you interview them that you respect them, you respect what they do, and you have to be prepared. You can't just like cold call someone and want uh, and expect a great quote without knowing what that person does, what that person is concerned about. So you, you, a lot of people, a lot of journalists just call people and want to quote and then just that's it. But you're, you're writing that person's name in a news story and thousands of people are going to read that story. So you have a responsibility to these people that you are prepared, that you know their concerns. And if you show that most people, to, to, to these people you're interviewing, most people will be, would like to cooperate because you're telling the story and usually people like that. I, I um. hope some of you at least will be here over lunch, but I think we need to move to the next, we're going to talk about internships, which I think is on everybody's mind. But before that, um, aren't they wonderful? Please give them a big hand. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. Do stay. I hope you will stay around, those of you who can. And if you can't, Anjani, I think you need to go. Thank you very much. It's lovely having you here. OK. Um, I'd like to introduce Lauren Dockett. And we introduce her with a tear in our eye, because she and Stephen, her husband, who's over there, um, are leaving us at the end of the month. Lauren has been uh, our internship coordinator. She's been handling the internships. We will have somebody else on board within maybe a month or so. But in the meanwhile, um, she's going to tell you a little bit about the internship program, um, give you some hints, um, and answer the questions that you might have. So, absolutely, I think I can do yeah, okay. I know you guys are probably starving. I'm starving. Um, so I'll try to keep this brief. And it's wonderful to see you all. I'm sorry I won't be here to meet with you all um, in depth. It's one of my the favorite things that I get to do here is really get to know uh, our new crop of journalists. And as you can see, from having just met some of our alums, um, there are lots of impressive people that you're going to be amongst while you're here. I just want to familiarize you really briefly with a section of the website, um, the careers and internship section. You can go through this and read all the other stories from other internships. But when it comes time for you to kind of figure out um, what you might be interested in doing in the winter, we do have a list of descriptions. It's not, um, it's not all we offer, but it just gives you a sense of some of the options, some of the people that we've worked with before, um, and also the variety of media outlets that we've worked with. Now, I hope all of you know that your, your schedule is really going to be so packed in the fall that this is not going after an internship in these next few months is really not going to be an option for most of you unless you're uh, doing this program part time. So we're talking about six weeks starting the 1st of December and ending about the 15th of January. Some of these outlets are happy to take on an intern for six weeks, some no, right? So especially broadcast, six weeks is such a short period of time to get somebody up to speed. Those might be internships you'll have to pursue in the spring or in the summer. But, but many, um, many outlets are happy to take you. HKU has a really good reputation, the JMSC in particular, not just in Hong Kong, but also on the mainland and then throughout greater Asia. Okay? Um, we have relationships. This program's been going on for about 10 years, the internship program. So we have relationships here in Hong Kong with all of the major international media. So we place people with CNN, both in broadcast and as reporters and writers for their international website. We work with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we work with Bloomberg, although they have their own formal internship program. They come to the campus and they try to recruit you guys to, to try out for their program. Um, we work with the International Herald Tribune, which is here. Um, at, uh, they have editor, sub-editor internships periodically, and also they have internships um, for their op-ed section. And then we do other English language, sort of more Hong Kong-based culture mags, like Time Out and various other magazines that you'll learn about while you're here. There's, there are also opportunities on the mainland, both for native English speakers um, and for folks who have native Putonghua, um, to work with international media, so CBS, ABC, uh, BBC, Al Jazeera used to be there. Um, but unfortunately uh, are not, although who knows what will happen over the course of this next year. Um, but if you have Putin Hua, um, then a lot of these major broadcast organizations are happy to have you come back to Beijing or Shanghai for those six weeks 
and work with them and, and be able to look at you know, Weibo with them and sort of tell them what's going on. And then there are really fantastic reporting and writing internships in other parts of Asia. Okay, so of course the mainland's really interesting, Hong Kong itself, very dynamic place, but if you're willing to travel, India is a terrific place. Anjani ended up writing for India Inc. and covering the, um, that huge rape story that happened. That happened while she was um, in Delhi um, over her internship. So if you actually trace back through the New York Times coverage, you'll find a bunch of Anjani's stories. You never know what's gonna happen in some of these places, really wonderful opportunities now in Myanmar, right? So Burma has just opened up and a number of our students have cycled through this last year. So that'll be an option. Nepal, um, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Thailand, really interesting stuff going on in Phuket. Okay, so if what you want to do is amass a number of clips in English language and do real sort of old school reporting and writing, think about leaving Hong Kong and think about going to one of these other countries to intern. Um, in a few weeks, you'll have another talk, maybe Doreen will give it, someone else here, um, about, she'll go into further depth about um, what you're gonna need to do to participate in the internship program. So we're gonna ask you to put together a resume, um, which is gonna be more of a journalism resume, really specific to journalism. Um, and we're gonna ask you to fill out um, some applications and have a look at at um, our handbook, just to give you a sense of what we expect from you. Once you've filled out an application and put together a resume, then you'll meet with whomever my replacement is, and they'll talk to you probably for about an hour. They'll go over that resume with you, make sure that it's good enough to put you sort of in a competitive range with other journalists. Okay, so it might be a painful meeting, but accept those, those criticisms. Um, and then, You'll also have a chance by then to start working on your clips. So if you've not done journalism before, it's really gonna be the work that you do in your classroom experiences, most especially probably your news reporting and writing experience. You wanna hone some of those clips so that we'll have something to send out uh, in November, October and November for, for an internship placement. If you're interested in a broadcast internship, uh, and you can do or uh, some sort of broadcast in the fall. Is that an option, Thomas? Um, and you haven't locked in your schedule yet, you might wanna try to do a broadcast class. You can get some shooting and some editing skills under your belt and put that on your resume in time for, for a winter internship. Also, you'll be developing a portfolio with Masato, I believe in the fall, um, an online portfolio. This is gonna be a very important tool for you both for getting an internship while you're here and then for landing a career outside of um, the JMSC. So put a lot of work into those portfolios. Those are gonna be your calling cards, your professional calling cards. And, and work that you do here at the JMSC really does qualify as a legitimate sample. You know, a lot of what we're doing in the classrooms, um, you know, if you're, there are people here doing podcasts, you're shooting, you're editing your own stuff, it's all very valid. You wanna put that up on your portfolio. Even if you feel like, oh God, this is just, a, class sample, really good legitimate stuff. Um, so don't be afraid of that. Um, lastly, people come to me quite often concerned about their various languages. You know, I, maybe I have native Putonghua, maybe that will help me to some degree, but my English really isn't up to snuff. Nobody is gonna hire me at an English language publication or all I have is English and here I find myself in Asia with no Cantonese and no Putinhua, who's gonna hire me. <laughs> We're gonna find a place for you guys to intern, no matter what your language background, and no matter what your work background. Finding a job beyond that, though, may be influenced by your language skills, okay? So while you're here, if English is not your native language and you want to work in international media, work really, really hard with people like Barry Cal, with, your, with people who are teaching you reporting and writing classes, um, to get your English as good as, as it can be. But also realize that you're selling yourself as a reporter who knows how to get the best information, knows how to shape a story, and has the language skills and the understanding, cultural understanding, maybe of mainland China, to be able to bring 
um, a perspective to a story that a native English speaker without that experience won't have. Okay. So there's room for everybody in Hong Kong and in greater Asia, whatever your language skills. Um, but you're going to have to learn to compensate one way or other, or to be able to sell yourself with what you do have. Now, those of you who don't have a journalism background, as you can hear, people have been speaking up today. Loads of people come to us from other um, backgrounds. We're going to help you write a resume, um, even if you've never put pen to paper for any media outlet. We're going to help you write a resume that really does sound legitimate. And the emphasis on that resume is probably going to be a lot on what you're doing in this master's program. But again, that's going to be legitimate work. Okay? And we're going to talk to you about what you've done previously. So if you've worked in finance before, did you do any kind of communication work in that finance job? If you've worked for an NGO before, you know, were there any kinds of social media um, that you ended up working with when you did that? So no, f no fear, okay? If you don't have a journalism background, you're, we're, we're still gonna help you um, really come across as somebody who has um, a lot to offer. And even the best internships um, each year are filled by people who haven't done um, any journalism but w when they get here. Okay, any questions? the time to ask them, I'm afraid. Yeah, this is the last time you have to get Lauren. <laughs> you, you get to ask Lauren this question. I've got a question. And then we break for lunch in five minutes. Hello. I, I was just wondering, I'm not really familiar with the structure of the program, so this actually counts as an elective when you take an internship? Um, you can take an internship for credit, or you don't have to take it for credit. Okay. So it can, if you want it to. Um, and I think it's, I don't know, Jason, is it four points? Three points, three points. So that's up to you. If you want, you know, if you'd rather have coursework, for, take up those points, then, then that's fine too. Um, and then if you do it for credit, we ask you to keep a little diary for us and have an evaluation at the end. But it's a very simple evaluation with others. Yeah. Um, I may not recall. But um, we have one internship in the, in the winter. Is there also an internship in the summer? So many of you will be looking for work in the summer, but we do do summer placements as well. So you're, you're, we won't formally think, okay, now I'm, we're gonna meet with you again in, in March or April to get you another internship. But if you decide that you want to both look for an internship and a job at the same time, then you'll come back and meet my replacement and say, I'm in the market you know, what's available for summer. And there are some good internships that really are only open in the summer. There's a list on the website under the one of the internship, the, like the internship block again, that has those internships that don't come specifically through us, but that we think you should apply to. So Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, um, the New York Times, if you have an American passport, various other ones that you should keep an eye on that are only summer, some formal summer internships. Also, AP does the same kind of thing. Are there any visa concerns, like staying past your student visa to complete um, like an internship that might go into the fall? How does In the that, summer? Do they, do they sponsor you? or? Uh, there's not a lot of sponsorship that goes okay. on, but actually immigration can be a little bit flexible okay. about that. You just have to go and, and go to the consulate and sort of talk to them about what you're doing. You have until you actually receive your diploma to still be, you're still considered a student even though you finished your courses. And I think that's July or so, the end of June. So you have those first early months and then beyond that, many of our master students are able to negotiate to be able to stay. Yep. You have a full year to work. She's asking about interning though. It gets more complicated. Oh, okay. Yeah. As long as you have work relationship, you have one year. Uh, one year. 
Yeah, Dor Dory yeah. Mendo, she's the um, lawyer. She can a couple of years ago, there, there used to be this concern, right? You know, where um, you'd say, okay, I have this internship, but I have to leave by August, and I've got to get a work permit, blah, blah, blah. So the Hong Kong government recognized, not just for journalists, but all kinds of students who are here from other countries wanting to stay here. So they changed the law, I think about four or five years ago, so that you have one year from the time that you get your diploma to do work here. So you could you can actually even be here to freelance. You could it doesn't have to be a formal work situation. After a year, then you if you want to stay, then you have to have you know some kind of work visa or, or other reason why you're here um, legitimately. Um, but they have recognized that that is a concern, and if they wanted to make, remain competitive to attract international students, that really made sense. Any questions? Anybody else? Um, and are you going to be here for a little, maybe over lunch? Will you have lunch? Okay, so she's still going to be around, but I'd like to break this uh, right now, and we can keep talking. We're going to keep talking over lunch. Now, um, you're going to be sitting at tables, not sit, sitting around here with each of your advisors, and I'd like to invite each advisor, Doreen, uh, Ying, Miklos, Kingwa, and Kevin over there to sort of pick an area we can rearrange the tables and then identify yourself so that your advisees can uh, come and sit with you. The food is behind you, so help yourself with food first and then find your advisor um, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Okay, so let's get started. Now, this is going to be a short afternoon session. Uh, Darcy here, who is our e-learning wizard guru, is going to take us through the websites where all your course information is going to be available. So he's going to explain that to you. And after that, we're going to throw it open to AJ uh, for a general question and answer session on student life, life in Hong Kong, all the questions that you didn't want to ask anybody else. Okay, so with that, over to you, Darcy. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, my name is Darcy Chris. I'm a digital specialist and e-learning officer at JOC. And I just wanted to give you uh, a couple tips moving forward so you can find your resources. Um, and uh, on, catch up. So we have this uh, website here, courses.jmse.hku.hk. And we're still bringing some of the course material online. So in terms of the MJ session here, there's only one link. And so some of the stuff's not available, but it will be within days. Uh, we'll also have some of the courses, depending on how the teachers are designing them, will have two different environments that you might find yourselves in. One's called Moodle, Moodle, which is a learning management system, and I'll show it to you in a second. And the other one's WordPress, which you're probably familiar with. And your teacher will explain a little better when and how you'll use it. <coughs> But do come back to this site. We'll try to push more resources onto it and provide links that help you navigate and deal with different problems you have with your courses. Um, so there'll be news and things on there, but we're just establishing that now. Um, Moodle, uh, I'm sure many of you have started to log into HKU Portal. When you come into the portal, you'll find uh, this environment called, this uh, tab up here called My eLearning. And this is one of the ways you, you, you can see all of your courses available to you. Um, so you can just come in here and there's links directly into the course. But Moodle itself is hosted on moodle.hku.hk, so you can always go directly there. And this system uh, provides various different activities related to your course, depending on how the teachers designed it. So you'll be getting emails from, from announcements from the teacher. You'll have forms, potentially, that will send emails to you and uh, you'll click on links and go right into this environment just by quickly logging into HKU Portal. Um, that brings up an important note. Uh, hopefully you would have received uh, information on accessing your HKU email, connect.hku.hk. Uh, this is an important address to use. I know many of you will have your own email addresses. I would encourage you for simplicity to uh, if you don't want to manage two mailboxes, to find up a way in, in that environment to redirect your mail. But please don't ignore that email address. Uh, there's also a little trick. When you first set up the account, you may receive lots of bulk email from the entire university. 
So you have to, there's a link on those bulk emails. You can go through there and prune any of the various different faculty and department notices that you're not interested in. And that'll make the email a lot more useful to you. But please use that email address because it's fixed and set up for Moodle. So if you don't use that, you won't know what's going on in your course. So I, I'm not gonna show you a lot of how Moodle works. This is just the basic environment. Uh, you've got navigation down the side that will show you your courses and you'll see the various different uh, modules or weeks, and uh, there's a lot of functionality in here. They also have what's known as a home page, sorry, right here, um, which will show all your courses, and this will give you an indication of assignments and various different activities that are coming up. So I think it's a pretty self-explanatory environment, but it's entirely dependent on how the course is designed and built. But do log in, and if you have any problems, you can talk to your teacher. You're also welcome to contact me, and we can try to make this work for you. And uh, I think that that's basically it. I wanted to just make sure you're aware of this. And then regarding WordPress, we're going to try to share more resources about using WordPress, little tips, techniques. And uh, we do have a site called Content Lab that's being developed which will show individual things about ways of embedding content and things like that that might be pertinent to your course. But again, you, you may not use WordPress for all your courses. So does anyone have any questions? Yes? This may not be directly related to this site, but I tried to access careers and internships and is asking me for a password and the Hong Kong HKU password is not working. Um, sorry. Password for the first internships. I think that whoever is the internship coordinator will give you that password. We block it so that it's not available to you. It's in public. It's just it's so you get that okay. Any other questions? All right. Good. So I'm going to hand it over to AJ and Jason and everybody else to do a Q&A. I don't really have much to say. Um, if you guys just got to Hong Kong and you haven't gone onto the Facebook group page, get on that. I think a lot of the questions that you guys had have been answered or are talked about. I think, uh, oh, I'm AJ if you guys want to know. If you have any questions about the program or just want to know dirt about JMSC, we talk on there about it. So. Bug Jason to get your name on the Facebook group page. Just bug him all the time. He loves it. It's, it's good. Uh, but yeah, any questions that you guys have about getting around Hong Kong, Hong Kong U, the classes? Uh, is Thomas actually a nice guy? Anything? No? I'm watching. <laughs> oh, right. But yeah, let me. Where's the computer? Uh, I'm just gonna show for those who don't know the Facebook group page. I'll just show it to you guys, and you guys can see kind of like the stuff that we talk about. This man's not here, right? How's the housing situation for everybody? Everybody doing okay? Anybody still don't have a place? Housing. Has everybody found just a couple? What housing situation going on so far? You? We haven't found. You haven't found. Um, you can talk to Jason. <laughs> <laughs> All my answers in are in progress. Yeah, yeah. So everybody mostly has finally found a place. So it did work out, right? Right. Once you got to Hong Kong, you did manage to find a place, and we did answer that on the Facebook page. To basically, answers. There's a lot of apartments in Hong Kong. It's just a matter of whether or not you have money. Um, so that's that. Visa issues. Everybody's cool. Obviously, you're here, right? So. Anything else? But yeah, um, in terms of TAing, I'm your TA for pretty much any course that you see a TA in. I don't know how that happened, but that's how it happens. Um, if you have any questions, Facebook me. I'm available all the time. Some people, like Wendy, messages me all the time. 
right? Chen Lee, I know we're here part of you. Message me all the time. That's okay. Who put this picture up? <laughs> My cousin put it. I did not know I looked like that back then. Right there. What mustache? Dude, that's when I was 16. I still don't have much face for me. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. It's like, it's taken me 32 years to grow this. Oh. All right, here we go. We have a... Yeah, anybody see it? Here it is. All right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we have a lot of... Any, any questions you guys have? Um, Post it on the Facebook group page. Only Jason and I right now have access to it. Thomas doesn't. Professor Chan doesn't. So you guys can talk about anything. Um, yeah, right? Course books. Do we have course books? Do we have course books for the program? No, right? Nothing. So there's the answer. Official answer? No. Yeah, textbooks. Nothing, right? I mean, again, most questions, this Q&A is going to be really short because ask on Facebook. We'll get to you as fast as we can. Um, Jason knows all the, other, uh, all the official answers. I know nothing. I'll tell you, go to Jason. Uh, and also ask your friends. A lot of the questions that we've had that have been answered, a lot of you guys helped out and answered for me. So, yeah, that's it. Anything else? Uh, go to Corey Cooper for hikes in Hong Kong. I know that. Everyone's tired, they want to go home and sleep or find apartments. I know, uh, going once, going twice. And tomorrow, drinks! I hold the coupon for Okay, everyone, I think you've all had a long, uh, a long morning, a long uh, well, day so far. Um, many of you have traveled long distances. So let's call it a day for now. Um, tomorrow, I hope all of you will be there at what time? Half past six? Six thirty. Okay, six thirty. Um, does everybody know how to get there, or they can get directions on uh, well through Facebook? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you figure it out. So we'll meet up again. In between, if you have any questions, um, all of us, myself, all the other faculty members, will be up on Elliot Hall. All our offices are on the second floor, so feel free to come by. Um, and otherwise, I have a, I have a question. Yeah, there, are some, there are some orientation uh, activities scheduled for tomorrow. There is a Hong LKU orientation for non-local students uh -huh. at 930 and then library orientations. Uh, what, what's the value of that and should we participate? Okay. He's asking what about the HKU uh, orientations for non-local and so on. I think just go. Um, and I think you probably will uh, definitely go for the library one and as well as I, I think you should go for anything that's on offer right um, it's always a good principle maybe maybe you learn one new thing that which will be helpful for you um, you'll meet up with other people other non-local students build networks so uh, go for them I would say yeah